Thank you. All right, welcome everyone to day four of Electronic Imaging 2020. I'm excited to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Electronic imaging is just my type of place. It highlights the latest work in imaging science, but it doesn't just shine one spotlight. This is an interdisciplinary conference. This week, we're hearing about the latest work spanning hardware capture, image processing algorithms, and of course, the vision science underpinning all of it. And it's not just the science. This venue is based in Silicon Valley for a reason. We're here to bridge the gap between academia and industry to ensure our good ideas are more than that, that they actually change our daily lives in a positive manner. And so in this talk, I'll shine a spotlight on display technology. Of course, it is often the end consumer of so much of your work on electronic imaging. And as with all technological revolutions, there's always a competition. Which is currently more capable, today's modern camera or display technologies? Which is currently the weakest link in the chain of delivering a faultless reproduction of reality? Of course, this is a system engineering question, and so I'm happy to say I'm joining you as the director of display systems research at Facebook Reality Labs. It's been about one and a half years since my last major public talk like this, so I'm really excited to share our latest work and talk about the path forward I see for electronic imaging and display systems in particular. And so these devices you see up here are just a handful of the virtual reality prototypes my DSR team uh, has built at Facebook. We'll get back to those in a minute. A lot of a talk like this is to deliver lessons learned. It's not about bragging about my work. It's really about trying to inspire you in the field to join me. On any mission, you can't go alone. And so today, the work I'm presenting is many dozens of individuals have contributed. I'm so proud to thank everyone in this team photo uh, for moving across the world and deciding, partly inspired by what I have to say, that it's worth moving their friends and family, uh, or making new friends and moving their family to join this adventure. So I can't claim everything you're about to see is my own, but it's certainly my team's. And when you are a scientist, you look for themes. And when I look at this photo as I prepared this talk, I realized there's a common thread. The scientists in this image all have published for the last decade, if you look carefully at their papers, on these sort of things. For about a decade, we've been working as a group, not just at Facebook, but at companies and, and academic institutions before it, to push the frontier largely of display technology, right? You can see all sorts of things here like eyeglasses, head-mounted displays, glasses-free 3D TVs, capture devices. And we found one community that it made the most sense for. You certainly would find my researchers in the hallways of electronic imaging, but all of this work comes from a different community, which is the ACM SIGGRAPH community. And so you may think it's very odd. Computer graphics, oftentimes in the hallway, people do ask me, they're like, wait, aren't you a computer graphics researcher? You seem to do a whole lot of display technology for graphics research. And I say, well, let me correct you what graphics even means. And so, not to be too pedantic, but I like to start at the root. And so the root of computer graphics has nothing to do with you know, the equations of rendering. It really has to do with the automation of the Renaissance, to try to replace artists fully by computers. And so let's go to the Renaissance briefly to see where computer graphics originated. And there are many people to draw from. There's so many beautiful quotes. There's so many Renaissance uh, individuals. But my personal favorite is this guy named Leon Battista Alberti. Hopefully you've heard of him. Uh, if you haven't, uh, do a quick Google search for Alberti's window, because I'm about to tell you about it. And he did many things. As with any polymath, he contributed to cryptography, painting, artistry. But he realized that painting and mathematics could be combined. And here's his quote on it in his de facto treatise. He said, first of all, on the surface on which I'm going to paint, I draw a rectangle of whatever size I want, which I regard, and this is the important bit, as an open window through which the subject to be painted is seen. So here we are in the Renaissance, and we realize that humans are full of faults. And Alberti knew that he could never become a perfect artist, and so on the right, you can see the beginning of computer graphics, tools to help the artist. Here, just by looking through a window that has rules on it, if you draw the same squares on your rectangle, your quadrilateral, as he wrote, then of course it makes the drawing task much easier. Instead of taking in a holistic scene, you just work at patches. And so, so there you go. Almost uh, 600 years ago, we have someone saying the goal of art is to make a faultless reproduction of reality. So what happens? Well, half a millennium later, the beginning of our community, electronic imaging, starts. And I can think of no better individual. This was the first quote in my thesis, so just about every talk like this, I'm obliged to show it. It's always a joke in the lab. 
This is Gabriel Lippmann, who was a Nobel laureate for inventing a novel type of color photography. And here's how, what he said. He basically gave a great, great quote without attribution to Alberti. So here it is. He wrote, is it possible to create a photographic print in such a manner that it represents the exterior world framed in appearance, and here's the part he should have actually done his literature search, between the boundaries of that print, whoops, let's go back there, as if the boundaries were that of a window open on reality. No doubt he thought this was a beautiful quote, it was just someone else's. But there was a challenge here. Of course, we believe in this field that if your goal is realism of what the Renaissance was pursuing, then a human hand cannot equal that of a camera. And so he basically picked up Alberti's challenge and he said, well, let's forget about Alberti's window. We now have Lippmann's window. And Lippmann's window is a photographic window because we can ask infinitely more perfection than that of the human hand. And so, almost 60 years later now, we're continuing this legacy of trying to build Lippmann's window. And this is how I ended my thesis. I said, well, that's, that's my life's work, to build camera, display, image processing technologies that can make a perfect glowing rectangle on a wall that's like a hole punched into another universe. But even that, even that feels like a 500 or 600 year old challenge because it's limiting. And so, as with so many of us in the computer graphics field, the real inspiration why I am in the field of computer graphics is Ivan Sutherland. It's always the answer. If you don't know anything about computer graphics, just guess Ivan Sutherland and you'll be right like half the time. Here's what Ivan had to say in the path that my team is on. He wrote a beautiful two-page document that you can read while you're half listening to this talk if you want, because it's a brilliant, brilliant two-page document. I wish I had written it. He said, the ultimate display would, of course, not be a window. It is, of course, a room. That is so overwhelmingly obvious. We spend our lives as humans in a three-dimensional reality. Why would we want to limit ourselves to two-dimensional depictions and recreations? We have as an artifact of technology and history, but let's go further. And so he, of course, went as far as you could go. He said that that room not only would be for recreating photons, I love this part. He said, within this room, a computer could control the existence of matter. A chair displayed in such a room would be good enough to sit in. Handcuff displayed in, in such a room would be confining. And I love this one. A bullet displayed in such a room would be fatal. Of course, he was describing the holodeck. And in 1965, the holodeck was a long way off, but he did it by leveraging technology and emerging computer science, emerging circuitry that could render graphics in real time. He built a vision of this ultimate display that so greatly surpassed Alberti and Lippmann that it drives us today. And here it is. The system uh, is referred to incorrectly, it's not its real name, as the Sword of Damocles. The Sword of Damocles is that tracking device that's at any moment going to fall and kill this lab assistant. But what he did was show that we as humans want to be in a personal space, to interact volumetrically. And you could never achieve this. There'd be no wall big enough in your house to have an immersive experience. But then in this short two-page memo, Ivan thought more more than Alberti and Lippmann combined on why we are doing this. Is it about recording reality? It is at first, but if you can create such a room, then why limit ourselves to depictions of things that exist? The greater potential, the boundless potential, of course, is to create these rooms, and with appropriate programming, those displays can depict anything. They can be the looking glass into which Alice fell. This has everything to do with why we're doing this. We're no longer limited just by photography, Computer graphics allows us to experience infinite realities. And Ivan writes so beautifully about it, I encourage you to look at it. So there you have it. This is the grand challenge. Now, that took several minutes to explain the grand challenge. And so when I'm in the hallway, when people ask me, why are you a computer graphics researcher, I sum it up much more simply. I say, my team is here to pass the visual Turing test. So my friend Gordon Wettstein and I, we both use this as motivations for our teams. We wrote about it in a paper a few years ago. Everyone knows what a Turing test is. A visual Turing test would be just that. You put someone in front of Lippmann win Lippmann's window or Sutherland's room, and you ask them, is this real or not? So how are we doing as a field? How close are we getting to making these faultless display technologies? Well, on one side of the coin, better than you'd probably shout out. This is a synthetic rendering, at least parts of it. If I didn't tell you that, you would just think this is a real photograph, but the car is in fact rendered. Using modern computer graphics techniques and with significant offline compute, you can simulate light transport to arbitrary accuracy. 
And so the synthesis side, the mathematical reality of what Sutherland wanted to do, we have achieved. The real question is, can you achieve it for the power and frame rate you want at the resolution you need? So I would argue computer graphics actually isn't that interesting anymore because this isn't the rate determining step. The rate determining step, the reason all those papers from my team are displays, displays are pitiful and they're way behind the state of the art in computer graphics because here, the high water mark of displays when you walk into an electronics store, they have not changed significantly for decades in the sense that they remain being two dimensional flat depictions. They are Alberti and Lippmann's window realized as completely as we can. Now they are remarkable. Huge displays, flat panels of glass made in valleys, shipped across the world on international shipping containers. It is a modern marvel. But the experience to the end user is you get a slightly, a much thinner rectangular window to watch at a distance. So only recently have we started making this not the rate determining step. And it's of course why I'm at Facebook Reality Labs is I believe this is great for certain cases but Sutherland was right. If you're gonna make a device that allows you to experience anything that, that a human can experience, it has to be virtual reality. We can't build a big enough room in our house. We can't have enough instrumentation to all own a holodeck. But we can certainly all have a mobile phone with some simple display technology to give you the full experience Sutherland was going for. All right, so that's, that's my motivation why virtual reality. Now, even with my own researchers, the thing I'm most known for is have you done a literature search? And so when I entered this field, I did a literature search and I said, what, what's worth working on? If we're gonna go beyond a television, it's pretty obvious, you know, it's like, well, with TVs we could do higher dynamic range, more color gamut, we could do higher resolution, but it's diminishing returns. So the question is, if you're gonna start working on virtual reality, where's the biggest bang for your buck? And the only way to answer that is to ask a vision scientist. The goal of these display technologies is to recreate a sense of depth, of three-dimensional reality. It's what televisions can't really do. And so you start with first principles, and here they are. You've probably all seen this. Every vision textbook has a taxonomy of depth cues. But I think this paper, if you're only gonna read one thing, this is it. From Cutting and Vishton in 1995, they did a broad literature survey, and they put these into a logical taxonom taxonomy where they said, look, if your goal of a display or of any system is to present depth, as a function of distance into the scene, how sensitive is a given cue at distinguishing depths? So if you look at a meter here, right, 10% contrast <clears throat> uh, versus 1% would make the difference between seeing the difference between something a centimeter in size or 10 centimeters in size. And in their nomenclature, 10% depth contrast is a salient feature. And so if we look at all these things, it's not clear why does a human vision system have so many depth cues? I mean, how many ways do you perceive audio, right? If you look at this, it's like the richness of cues that we've been designed to process is phenomenal. And they argue in this paper, it's because we don't live in just one space, we live in three. And for most of us in this field, we've been working in what's known by, as the vista space. Objects that are far beyond where you can take action, way beyond the end of this room, looking out to the beautiful San Francisco skyline, that's the vista space. And the cues that dominate there, of course, are occlusion. Is the bridge in front of the hills? Relative size, are the cars clustered, uh, are the cars appearing bigger near me or smaller further away? Aerial perspective, we're in San Francisco. Fog, you get an absolutely great sensation of depth from aerial perspective. Relative density and height in the visual field. Now, if you think about this as an end-to-end -end system, can we design ca cameras that can capture the San Francisco skyline? Yeah, we could do that decades ago. Can we design displays that when properly seated, faultlessly recreate these? Yeah, they're called televisions. They do a great job at all these things. Now, you could always do better. Higher dynamic range, higher color gamut, higher resolution. But again, if you wanna be at the forefront of a field, move to where everyone isn't. And so I would argue where we haven't been is where things are hard, which is what uh, Vishen and Cutting call the personal and action spaces. This is the no man's lands for television. Everything within my uh, reach, the people I can hit by throwing this uh, presentation remote, you are in my action space. And in that space, new depth cues come into play. Binocular disparity, motion parallax, convergence and accommodation. Televisions do a terrible job of recreating these cues, which means 
if you're going to work on VR and AR imaging and display technologies, here you go. From first principles, you're definitely working on these. And so from first principles alone, we already see a gap in the literature. If you want a hard display challenge, it turns out to be the most subtle cue of all. The one thing we have failed to depict in any display and capture technology to date is vergence and accommodation cues, which we'll be talking about today. And so I'm very happy to say most of this talk is about vergence and accommodation, not because it's the most important cue. It's actually the least important cue, but it's the only thing we're left. On this path to creating Ivan Sutherland's room, it's the one thing we got to get right to finish the journey and then focus on making things great. Now, I won't say I'm the first person to realize this. Many of my friends from the stereoscopic displays and applications community have been here for many years working on delivering these depth cues. And so all these stereoscopes, of course, the one thing they miss is when you look at the ordering of depth cues, motion parallax is often more important, more sensitive than binocular disparity itself. And so a head-tracked stereoscope, there is no better display to present objects in the personal and action space. And so if you're interested in this, I encourage you to attend the remaining part of the 31st year, because it's a long journey just to get binocular disparity right, let alone motion parallax, invergence, and accommodation. All right, so with that, that's a little bit of my thinking over the last five and a half years I've led a team at Facebook Reality Labs on what we're doing and why we're doing it, and why we built so many headsets you're about to hear about to address the least important depth cue possible because we're trying to fill in the table. Before that table is complete, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We need to give humans the full sense of depth cues and then make those cues accurate and have high dynamic range. So let's dive deeper. Now I see many students in the audience. Maybe those of you are about to embark on grad school. Someday, all of us will be in new hire orientation again. I was in it myself five and a half years ago. For those of you who haven't had a job yet, you've been in grad school the whole time. New hire orientation is a boring day where you sign a lot of paperwork to get your health care and all those things. The new hire orientation I'm talking about is this one. You spent decades getting uh, an education, learning how to be a world expert in electronic imaging. You walk into a lab, you signed all that paperwork, you're sitting at your desk, go. Find a problem worth working on that is worth decades of your life. That's a big new hire orientation challenge. And so when I came into Oculus, I had the benefit that I'd worked in this field for about half a decade. I had a lot of preconceptions. Given a blank slate, what would I pursue? What could make VR headsets better? Well, if you don't start with the cutting in Vishton, you start with the obvious stuff. Gee, it'd be nice if they're more ergonomic, if they're lighter, if they're wider field of view, if they're brighter. But you've got to ask, is that really delivering something of value to the overall experience if there's still missing things? And so all I can say for the students out there is pay attention to the subtle things. Don't come in with your preconceptions and just work on wide field of view headsets because you want to. And so I spent months playing around with things but convincing myself all might be dead ends. But then one day, my manager, Michael Abrash, came in and he said, guys, we need something to convince people. There's only so many talks Doug can give to inspire them. We got to show it to him. So we had an early Oculus headset, confidential, have to sign an NDA to see. But we needed something to show on it. And so we had a brilliant team of artists and game developers make this thing called Paper Town. And the idea of Paper Town is to make the killer app. Now, it's not a great game. There's nothing you can do in it other than look around. What's killer about this is, let me go back, is it's a toy world. Based on that Vishton and uh, cutting work I showed you, if you're going to show off VR and AR, it shouldn't be in the Vista space. And so this entire little world was like a toy box. It's called Paper Town. So every character is like action figure size. The entire world fits within arm's reach, which means motion parallax, binocular disparity, and vergence and accommodation are the most salient cues to depth. It is more viscerally near you than any television can depict. And so my manager said, this plus the headset plus a really good sales pitch, everyone will join this team once they see it. So I installed all the software. We got the headset set up. I was so excited to try it myself. A thing I can say to you in life is if something is hyped up, it's never going to live up to the hype. And I'm fortunate to say this one did not live up to the hype. I'm glad they didn't use it to recruit me because it had a big problem. So what my manager saw when he wore the headset is on the left. What I saw is on the right. And so I saw this beautiful toy world, put on the headset. I'm like, this is great. This is great. 
I leaned in to look at these little figures, and all of a sudden, I hope you can see this, they were thrown out of focus. And keep in mind, we live in a world of retina displays. Cell phones, laptops, televisions, they all exceed one arc minute 2020 visual acuity. We are so blessed with resolution that we don't even think about it anymore. And so I had not experienced since the 1990s a lack of resolution. And so looking in on this campfire and being frustrated with the blur, I didn't know what was going on. And it took me a while to convince people this was a problem because unfortunately, for those of you who are over the age of 60 or so, if you wear bifocals or progressive lenses, VR is great. And I'll explain why in a minute. But those of us who still have some years to go, you will see blurry objects in the near field. And so I encourage you to all try this, not to make my company look bad, but in the effort of advancing science, the next time you get a VR demo, ignore what the person's telling you to do, lean in real close, and either get frustrated that you're getting old enough that it doesn't bother you, or be very happy that you saw a problem, and you know the solution in about 45 minutes or less. <laughs> all right, so let's dive in. What is the solution and cause of this problem? It's virgin's accommodation conflict. This is an incredibly popular topic. I do not know why. It takes five minutes to explain. I always say if your research needs more than an elevator ride to explain, it's bad, right? If you don't have an elevator pitch, just don't work on it. This one, it'll take me like 10 elevator rides, and you'll still come back to me and tell me you don't believe this is a problem. So all I can say is when you're sitting at new higher orientation, be courageous and potentially choose problems that are hard to explain. I still take a lot of time to explain this problem, so let me try my best. Why did I see the blur? Well, let's go back to Paper Town and think from first principles. Here is that cartoon little toy box world. I'm trying to look at that fire hydrant on the bottom. Let's look from the side here. Here are my eyes looking at the model. Now, first of all, in order to see things in stereo, you need to verge your eyes to have a low enough binocular disparity that your vision system can process it. So when you verge, you also need to focus, right? The crystalline lens of our eye is there to make sure we always get a sharp image on our retina, and it needs to be a lens to collect enough light so that we can actually get a signal. So vergence, the act of rotating your eyes inward to look at something, is yoked to accommodation. And so when you verge, you also drive the focus of your system to be at that vergence point. There's a simplification, but it, that's basically what happens. So what happens? Well, the fire hydrant comes into sharp focus. You see it in stereo. And if you attend to a distant object, it'll be blurry. And I love seeing the audience do this because it's sort of funny. I should take a photo. But if you take your finger out, bring it to your face, close one eye, make sure you can focus on the ridges of your finger. Looking at that distance, I can guess your ages now, which is cool. Uh, so now, given that ridges on your finger, if you attend but not look at the distance, I should be super blurred. And then if you do the opposite, vice versa. So that's virgence and accommodation. Blur is a depth cue. So if you're playing with your finger, I know a lot of you are embarrassed by it. You're not doing it. That's OK. So if you look in the distance, you look at this skyline, your eyes will verge far away. Accommodation will move with virgence. And you'll notice the blur has changed. Near objects are now blurry. Far objects are sharp. And so now, we've finished like five elevator rides already. Now, what happens when I put on a VR headset? Anyone want to shout out the answer for no credit? Who hasn't seen this talk before? It's all right to be wrong. See, if someone yelled out Ivan Sutherland, that would be like amazing, just as like a random guess, <laughs> since I gave you that hint earlier. But next time. So when you put on a VR headset, at first it seems pretty good. Those of you who've worn a VR headset, it's probably not that bad of an experience. You look far away. It's actually better than the reality. Near objects are usually blurry in reality. They're now sharp. And why is that? Well, VR headsets have a lens with fixed focus. And so if you take a thin lens, look it up in Wikipedia, put it at its focal length from a screen, it'll create a virtual image at infinity. So generally, VR headsets are optimized to make good images of things far away, which means the fire hydrant in a VR headset is actually focused at the same distance as the distant skyline. Everything's far. That means you need to add digital blur if you want it to be correct, would be one way to go. Now, what do you think happens if I try focusing near in a VR headset? What happens is the video I showed earlier, which is everything gets blurry. Hopefully, now it's clear why. Because a VR headset is focused far. That's fact one. Fact two, virgence and accommodation are linked. So if I verge near, 
everything's focused far, it's like throwing the lens out of focus on a camera. Not just near objects, but near and far objects are blurry. There's no amount of deconvolution or image processing that's gonna get you out of this because there's no negative light. You are stuck. Things are blurry, and if you wait long enough, they'll get sharp, but you'll wear bifocals in real life, so it's not a great solution. So what do we do? Now, we moved through literature search, we moved through back of the envelope, there's no more procrastinating to be done, new higher orientation to over, time to get to work, time to be a technologist, and so you try to solve this problem. And this is the part of the job I love the most, is when you have a motivation. It's not just a problem you believe in, it's a problem that literature has endorsed as a whole in the field, you know what a solution would look like, it's measurable, and now it's just a question of who's the cleverest person in the room, and there's always someone more clever than me. And so when we started on this project uh, five, five years ago, we tried to one-up each other, and this is the table we came up with after a few weeks of debating. The rows of this are all the possible technologies that could address virgence accommodation conflict, right? Fixed focus, monovision, verifocal, holography, uh, light fields, all these stuff we'd, we'd published so many SIGGRAPH papers on. And then the columns are the dimensions you care about as engineers. Resolution, field of view, eye box. If you look at this and you believe the color coding, and I never believe the color coding if someone else did it, but if you believe me, there's only one thing here, two things here that look like good solutions. The first and best solution to all problems in life is to ignore the problem. If you just stick with fixed focus, there's no problem as long as objects stay in the vista space. If objects are far away, they'll be sharp. Problem solved. Unfortunately, VR is not a great television. It's great for personal and action space. And so you gotta solve it, which means there's one thing left, verifocal. Verifocal has only two red boxes. You're gonna need eye tracking. Nah, yeah, okay, well everyone's working on eye tracking, so that's okay, and you're gonna need an adaptive optic. Go to any optics conference, there's a ton of ways to change focus. And so that's what we set our sights on uh, about five years ago now, to build the world's first fully functional end-to-end -end verifocal headset, and to see if it's any good knowing that this is the least important depth cue based on cutting in vision. So we knew that it was sort of a thankless task, but we did it nonetheless. Let's take a look at what the verifocal headset really looks like. So if you zoom in here, here's the scene shown one more time. For most individuals under the age of, I don't know, let's say 45, 50, you can at least accommodate over four diopters, 25 centimeters to optical infinity when you're corrected to normal. So what we would do is take a normal VR headset and change its focus over a four adapter range based on eye tracking. This is not a new idea. To my knowledge, Shiwa in 1996 were the first to propose and demonstrate this in a lab. So we'd gone through this entire gauntlet, convincing ourselves based on this table that this is the right way to do it if you want to do it anytime soon. And so now we go to the engineers and we say, please make this happen. And so my friend Ryan Ebert, the lead mechanical engineer I work with, took about two weeks and threw this thing together, prototype one. And in prototype one, we got rid of eye tracking. We we're like, that's a problem for another day. Let's just lean in and see that fire hydrant sharp and clear and be happy and try to convince people this is a problem worth, worth working on. And in those two weeks, Ryan developed a high-speed actuation system, but not a silent one, because this is phase one, tech readiness level two, if you're familiar with NASA. If you look at this, let's see if we hear the audio. This is what it sounded like. Whoops. It's loud, but it can move orders of magnitude faster than the crystalline lens in your eye. So it's over-engineered to see what it'll ultimately need to be. So we put that all together, and it convinced us, yeah, everyone in the lab saw it. They're like, okay, I get it. You could have just like put a focus knob on a Viewmaster. I also would have got the problem. So we're like, got message taken. We'll dial back the engineering next time. But we didn't. We went the other way. We dialed the engineering up. So about a year after this demo, we said we had to do it for real. We had to have eye-tracked, verifocal, running Oculus games to really see, is this the most important problem or should we move to some of those other ideas I had at new employee orientation? So this one was a beast. It weighed two kilograms, but is, to my knowledge, the first fully functional verifocal headset ever built. Uh, and here's what it looked like. So again, fully functional. You have real game content, on the bottom left, you can see the eye tracking signal. On the bottom right, you can see me moving with real-time sixed off tracking. This is what a verifocal experience looks like. So you pick up the controller. You can see the little gaze fiducial show me where I'm looking. And then we add the depth of field blur digitally. So when you look far, near objects are correctly blurred because those photons are done computationally, not optically. So this is the first example of a computational display in the talk. 
And there you have it. And you'll even notice the distortion correction changes dynamically because the way we changed focus changes distortion, field distortion as well. So it sounds good, but actually does not sound good at all because here's what it sounded like. Let's see if it plays. And keep in mind, I knew I'd be showing this, so that was like the least noisy it was ever. But this is a fully functional level three prototype that shows you this is worth, level four technically, that shows you this is worth doing. Now you begin the journey. So this was many years ago at this point. I came to my manager and I said, okay, research done. You know, I can go publish this and someone else will solve this. Someone else will take this to market. My job as a researcher was to show there's a problem, show there's a potential solution. And Michael said, you could certainly do that, but you have brilliant mechanical engineers. How about you let them take a swing at it? And so over a year period, I can't claim any credit other than managing the program, Ryan Ebert and the mechanical engineering team produced this thing, uh, which we call prototype three in this slide, undisclosed top secret name internally. Prototype three is a vir modern virtual reality headset. It weighs like a modern virtual reality headset, and inside of it, that crazy loud actuator you saw early was miniaturized and made absolutely or near absolutely silent. I mean, you really gotta like hold your head against the device to hear anything. Uh, vibration free, again, unless you like put your face against that part of the device. Uh, so we thought we'd really solved it. So then it's the time to go back to that new employee orientation. We said, great, modern VR headsets, if we so wanted, could have eye tracking, could address virgin's accommodation conflict, if only we allowed moving parts. So what do we do next? Well, next is you get a freebie, right? At many technology companies, you get 20% projects. And I said, 20% of the time, I want to build the VR headset I want. And despite everything I set up to this point, the thing I wanted was much more field of view. You know, the whole point Ivan Sutherland had was to be immersed in your room. And so if you're gonna be immersed, you need super wide field of view. And so this one, you know, continues to be a varifocal headset, had integrated eye tracking, but it really went for the immersion angle. Have the widest field of view VR headset uh, built. Here's what it looked like. So we partnered with the optics team internally to design the lenses. They designed them, we made them varifocal. If you look at this, you zoom into uh, Oculus Rift on the left. Let's see if that video will go this time, sorry. Let's let it auto play. Yeah, if you zoom into that, it, depending on how you measure field of view, which is a one hour talk in and of itself, it doubled the field of view or horizontally went from you know, around 100 to 140. Very immersive, very compelling, and the demo worked. You could play every single Oculus game at the time in that headset, you could lean in, you could see things sharp when you bring them forward. And so just to convey that, we came full circle. I didn't use Paper Town, I should have, but I didn't film it. So I used a different Oculus demo, but on the left you can see with varifocal off, emulating the focus of a human eye, very blurry text in the near field. Try the demo, message me if it's not blurry when you try it. And on the right, very sharp text. Okay, so where do you go from there? Well, where you go from there is address skeptics. So even though we made the device silent, even though it was vibration free, we knew if we could have an electro-optic solution, no moving parts, of course everyone would be happier. And so, three and a half years of effort produced these headsets. We threw them away, and we said, let's start again and make a headset that is the smallest, lightest VR headset made, best resolution we can make, no moving parts varifocal with eye tracking, and we did it. We showed it to the world earlier, about a few months ago. Uh, don't, don't ask about Half Dome 2, you can read about it online. Half Dome 3, uh, is a folded optic headset, very high resolution, super ergonomic, and no moving parts varifocal. So let's take a look inside of this device to learn how it worked. I love these exploded view diagrams, this is my favorite. So on the right, you know, I, I also love being a company that lets me show this stuff. On the right, no joke, is everything inside a Half Dome 3, uh, Half Dome 1. Uh, so you can see the motors, the enclosure. To get that huge field of view, it's just optics, it requires a, a large volume. On the left, we still have 20 to 20% 20 more field of view than a modern VR headset. So it's, still, it's incredibly small and no moving parts electronic varifocal. You gotta ask yourself, how'd you do it? How'd you make a, a no moving parts electronic varifocal? The answer is I didn't. I hired a brilliant intern, Afsun Jamali, who'd been pioneering the use of liquid crystal lenses in graduate school. 
And over an internship, which turned into a postdoc, which turned into a very large team, we took this idea and carried it through. And so here's what Afsun and Yang Zhao, an optical scientist on my team, put together, uh, along with a lot of engineers. This is an electronic varifocal module that is a set of six liquid crystal lenses. And in this conference, uh, I can get a little more technical. These are pancheratinum berry phase or geometric phase lenses. So they're thin uh, diffractive optical elements made of liquid crystal that essentially give you a different programmable focal length from a flat lens. In between them, we place switchable half wave plates. So you can think of this as a stack of binary lenses. Let me explain it better. So on the right, you can see a module. When you turn this lens on, or the switchable half wave technically, you focus on the near dinosaur. When you turn it off, you get the negative focal length. Oops, animation went ahead, ahead of me. When you turn it off, you get a far focus. You get the other focal length. And so now by stacking up a set of these with carefully designed focal lengths, you get an electronic lens. Now we'll let the animation go. That in this case has 64 focal states. And if you wanted 128, you just add one more lens. So this gives you, at least for a human, a smooth varifocal experience with no moving parts. And to prove it's real, you know, it's like the newspaper clipping, you gotta show a through the lens image. So this is a through the lens image of once again, someone's moving the focus of a camera to follow the focus of the headset. And those of you who work on liquid crystal technologies to see no flicker, no changes in brightness, no changes of color, of course that was what took a year and a half to make this thing that compelling. And so I really wanna thank Afsun, Yong, and the rest of the team for pioneering this and giving me all the credit by getting to talk about it publicly, so thank you. So there you have it, that was our journey on electronic varifocal. But we have more time, so now that's in a sense the startup, right? I'm, I've always been a researcher at heart, I've always been driven by publications more than really even demos. And so this, this is the 20% time now where rather than just trying to take today's VR systems cross off accommodation in a way that's practical, now we start dreaming. We start thinking of compelling things that may not be possible right now. And so you immediately, you just assume. Being inside a team that's making verifocal reality, you just assume it's gonna happen. It's just a question of when, not if, uh, in many ways, if you work on a team like that. What happens after verifocal displays? Well, again, there were a lot of other things in that table that were a lot more red. But once a varifocal display exists, we can count on eye tracking, we can count on adaptive optics. So what's the next least red thing in the table? Well, the problem with verifocal is not Ivan Sutherland, it is in fact eye tracking, I won't ask you to shout it out. The real question is can eye tracking be avoided? Now eye tracking is a technology that is in no current uh, Facebook products, but it's something we're looking at for the future. So if you already know the future may have eye tracking, you could just punt, but there is an academic question here. Many of the things in that table did not, or people believe do not need eye tracking. Wouldn't it be great to eliminate the dependency between the verifocal system and an eye tracking system, which inherits a whole set of risks to stand up? And if you've ever looked at eye tracking images, you know why you'd want to avoid it. This is what you'll see if you do a Google search for eye tracking, you know, the platonic ideal. The pupil is an ellipse, you can track these glints. Oh, it's so easy, we can track 99% of people 99% of the time. Only 99% of people, that 1%, do not have the canonical eye. So here's something you'd have to deal with to get to the 99%. It's probably hard to see, but the eye appearing on your left doesn't have an elliptical uh, pupil, a circular pupil. There's actually intrusion of the iris into the pupil. And so all of a sudden, you know, your ransack algorithms looking for that ellipse are gonna get confused. And they're gonna get confused anyways because of course you have droopy eyelids and eyelashes. So now just like a simple ellipse fit with Ransack probably ain't gonna cut it unless it's a grad student project. And on top of that, if you're a computer vision researcher, this is not a rigid body tracking problem. This is my favorite video in the talk. I hope you can get it at this distance. Here is why eye tracking is both creepy and difficult. Let me play this high speed video. Do you see that? So if you watch the boundary of the pupil, you'll see it bounces because it's a non-rigid body. Here we go. So even, even your assumptions about the eye, if you're gonna do this for real and not just a class project, you have to model the, the eye as a non-rigid body potentially. This is a hard problem, like italicized hard. 
So wouldn't it be great to eliminate it from the display system so I could show you demos earlier? That's the way I was thinking at the time. And so when you do that literature search, the next thing in the hierarchy is a multifocal display. So this is something that Marty Banks, Kurt Akeley, and many others pioneered. Uh, for many years, the earliest publication, like slightly before Kurt, is this Neil 1997. The idea is rather than dynamically move one plane of focus under eye tracking, just have many planes of focus. It's known as a multifocal display. You could present, for instance, at high speed, sweep through the focal length, and display different images on different planes. So the thinking here is whatever you want to show. If it's the fire hydrant, you can use the front focal plane. If it's a skyline, you can use like the third focal plane. The problem with this idea at the time was there's an open question. How many planes do you want? And it's very easy in a hallway to say, well, you'll never have enough. Because it's probability zero, a pixel, a point on the scene will actually live on a plane. So you'd like to display what's on the left. But if you actually have fine eight-point font presented between the focal planes, once again, vergence accommodation conflict occurs. You get blur. And you can't have it both ways. If you're stimulating the eye to focus correctly, then it'll focus between planes. So brute force always wins. Just have more planes. But now, at some point, you're stuck with even a DMD can't give you enough focal planes in rapid enough succession with good field of view, good brightness. And it's just sort of diminishing returns. And so again, if you think as an academic, it's easy to get out of this hole. You're like, what degree of freedom would solve it? How about a verifocal multifocal display? Two good ideas, probably better than one good idea. And so this was first proposed, I believe, by Wu in 2016. It's a new idea. Don't use eye tracking, but look at the 3D geometry and do sort of like principal components. Look for where the objects are. And when you present a focal plane, you may still only get to have four focal planes, but you can move them with the content. It's a good idea. The question is, can you represent natural scenes effectively with moving focal planes like this? And if so, you know, like what percent are within so many diopters? And really, this now becomes a true computational display problem. How you render for this, how you optimize, and if it's any good becomes a vision science question. And so we decided to focus on that one. And when you're focusing on vision science, the key is to write down what you're trying to do. What I've learned with vision science research is it's very easy to go down the rabbit hole of over-engineering a system. You really just want to know what questions you're trying to answer. And so when we started working on multifocal displays, we didn't jump to building a headset. We decided to build an apparatus that's not head-mounted that could support verifocal, multifocal, adaptive multifocal, and some related ideas. It had integrated best-in-class eye tracking, because we wanted to understand, do we need eye tracking for multifocal or not? We had to figure out how to render and decompose images in real time. So it's a real time optimization problem. And finally, it had to sense not just vergence, but accommodation. There's a long list of things. And so I'm very happy to say my colleague, Yusufu Sulai, built this single handedly, uh, one of the most complicated devices. I'm incredibly proud of what he did. I just photographed it. So that's my, <laughs> my credit I can take. Uh, here is our multifocal perceptual test bed. So let's zoom in here. There's a lot to take in. But this is what I think vision science looks like for display systems research at FRL. First of all, what are you even seeing? Well, if you look at this, that's a state-of-the-art eye tracking system. You can see the cameras, infrared illuminators, can track the eye as well as anything at the time. That's vergence tracking, though. Then Yusufu's specialty was accommodation tracking. So this has essentially like an auto-refractor, the type of thing you'd have an optometrist that can sense the state of the crystalline lens of your eye. On top of that, we have three displays per eye, three for the right eye, that's multifocal, and three for the left eye. So here's what the verifocal, multifocal display looks like when you zoom in. So this is just the right eye. So you can see we have each of these on those crazy translation stages you heard earlier. They can move independently. The optical quality is high because Yusufu engineered it. So this can emulate everything I've presented so far in the talk, but not on your head. We combine those images relay them to the eye box. Then that gives you, through a beam splitter, the eye tracking signal. And then with a super luminescent diode that's safe for the eye, bounce off the retina, come back to a wavefront sensor. Uh, to my knowledge, an instrument of this class has not been built elsewhere, although Marty Banks, if you're interested, has a variant of this. And I'm sure he'd be happy to do science with you, because that's the whole point. We're talking about this because we want to not just brag about it, but encourage others to join. And Marty was the first person I, I met working on multifocal, and he convinced me it's a good idea. 
So if you're excited about it, please reach out to Marty, because it's really, he's the one who, who began all of this with Kurt. So what do you do with an instrument that costs untold amount of money and time? You answer a question, because it's academic, that may seem petty, which is an argument I've had in many hallways, which is, do you need eye tracking for multifocal displays? The whole point was to get rid of eye tracking, so did we? I would argue no. So if you look at the image on the left, this is where the camera, sorry, the image on the right is where the camera is perfectly aligned. It's exactly where it's supposed to be. And you'll see, as you move focus with no eye tracking, just optically, things come in and out of focus correctly. But if you displace that camera by just like two millimeters, I believe, everything falls apart because it's like billboards, right? The, the first layer, second layer, third layer, they don't align correctly along the line of sight due to the parallax of the eye. And so the ocular parallax uh, is enough that I believe at high resolution you will need eye tracking for multifocal, which makes it no more or less compelling than verifocal itself. But it was only, you can only get a glimpse of that by really over-engineering the test bed. And so that's just a side of the work I enjoy doing now that I have the resources to build something like that and the friends that like doing it. Okay, we have a little more time, I hope. We can dive into two more topics and then wrap up. Okay, so I tried to convince you multifocal displays are interesting, but don't dodge the central problem. They still probably need eye tracking. They certainly need adaptive optics. So let's just imagine a world, though, once again, where multifocal happens, verifocal happens. Once again, what comes next? Now we're getting maybe 10 years into the future. Who knows? This is the part of the job I love the most, which is to just sort of throw, throw practicality out the window with the only caveat being it should line up with the story. If verifocal happens, if multifocal happens, then the next thing will always happen, dot, 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 until holography. But until holography seems like the thing that's gonna happen next, there's probably some intermediate steps. So in that giant table of ideas, there was only one that was new that came up from all this brainstorming, all of the one-upmanship of like, here's a clever idea for accommodation. And I'm sure all of you would come up with this. Some of you in minutes, some of you in several minutes, but all of you by the end of the day would have this idea, which is, if you can't solve it with adaptive planar surfaces, why have planes at all? Verifocal moves a plane. Multifocal positions multiple planes. Why don't we at least tilt the plane? Right? If I want to focus on the road, I can use a tilt shift lens, and one plane can cover the focus of every point on the road. This is the, the thinking that, that got us to conclude this is probably the way to do it if you have a fully capable adaptive optic. Get rid of the planes and create a surface. So imagine an optical element, some freeform lens that's distorted in a strange way so that it wraps the focal plane around the scene like a gift. So no one had tried this yet, and part of the reason is there's not a great set of widgets out there to do this degree of freedom focal surface control, but I'll show you one in a minute. But this was the proposal, the thought experiment, that perhaps we could get rid of the need for eye tracking if we only needed one focal surface. And the thing here is we know, based on cutting and vishten, that focus accommodation is the weakest of all the depth cues. So you can probably afford to make the most mistakes. You know, so when you look at this focal surface, it missed the UFO here. But how much did it miss? Was it a tenth of a diopter? Was it a thousandth of a diopter? In which case, it probably doesn't matter for the vision system. And if you missed, you probably didn't miss by much. And so computational imaging comes in. You can deconvolve the image, try to sharpen it just a little bit for that defocus. So that was the idea. And if that didn't work, there was one last sledgehammer, which is a multifocal surface display. And so now there's a competition. Do you want a whole bunch of planes or maybe just one or two focal surfaces? That was the question. Here's how we answered it. We built a demo. First, that demo was simulation. Now in MATLAB, everything works. Every idea you ever have always works in MATLAB. It's why I love MATLAB so very, very much. And so th this idea worked. So with no eye tracking whatsoever, you focus on the distant scene, you focus on the near objects, no popping, no flickering. We're like, cool better than multi multifocal displays, let's move on. Only problem was this was a simulation. Now the real question is how do you focus across a surface? How do you bend that focal surface into arbitrary shapes? This is why I come to conferences. It's not to talk, it's to go into that hallway over there and talk to people at companies and be like, do you have a widget that can do this local focus thing? 
And I tell grad students, and I tell professors, and I tell my friends, and eventually someone will say, yes, I have a widget that I can hand you that will do what you need. And the answer for this one, you probably have already guessed, whoops, is a spatial light modulator, a phase-only spatial light modulator. These sort of things exist because of the LCOS uh, display industry, but they also exist because of science. Uh, if you're doing a digital holographic display, you'd buy a phase SLM like this to manipulate coherent light. But notice everything I've spoken about here. It's a full color display driven maybe by LED illumination. This is most definitely an incoherent light source. And so a thing I learned from my PhD advisor, Ramesh Raskar, was just ignore the spec sheet. If it says it requires monochromatic green light, just reject that as a fact. If it says it has to be illuminated perpendicular to the surface, it probably doesn't. Just reject that as a fact. And so we did. We completely abused how SLMs are supposed to be used. Turns out it mostly worked. So, you know, manufacturer warnings are just guidelines, let's say. That's my personal feeling, not company statement. Um, so if you look at this, here's what uh, Nathan Matsuda, uh, who was a grad student at the time and now a full-time researcher in DSR, this is what he built. Uh, he also makes amazing animations, so that's all Nathan, that's not me. So we blow it up to make it look really complicated, mostly for reviewers, so they'll accept the paper, but it's not complicated. What we did is we got a Thorlabs lens that had a longer than normal focal length to give us more room to play with, and we had a phase spatial light modulator on one end. This is a VR headset, just made with a fancy spatial light modulator. Sorry, it is an OLED on that end. This is a VR headset. Then we throw in our fancy phase spatial light modulator halfway between. Now phase SLMs need polarized light, so we throw in a polarizer and an analyzer. And so what this does is if you look at the wavefront leaving the display, it's first shaped by the SLM locally, and then most of the optical power is achieved through a high quality you know, A-sphere refractive lens on the front. So you can think of this as a digital compound lens, where most of the optical work of focusing is done by a high quality refractive optic, and then just a little bit of local focus change by a few diopters is done by this diffractive optic. To our knowledge, no one, no one had ignored manufacturer warnings so much in the past, so this was a lot of fun to get to play with for the first time. But we could not find a transmissive SLM like this. And so instead, we had to throw in a beam splitter, which means fields of view go down, but publication deadline comes in. So now, light leaves, goes through the beam splitter, gets locally focused by the SLM, comes back through the beam splitter, goes out the lens. A lot of wasted light here, but it does allow you to build a fully functional focal surface display. Uh, and so here it is. Button that back up. Ask our brilliant mechanical engineers once again to go into the trenches and come out with this thing. And so this is a working VR headset uh, that we had at the time. And if you pull the facial interface off so you can get a camera lens close enough, this is uh, one of the better results we saw, because whenever you see a result at a conference, you know it's the best result. So this is the best result, let's say. Uh, here we have a camera focused on the police car stay within RF range. And now, again, with no eye tracking, just optical focusing of the camera, we get correct blur, and generally, for a computational display, not too bad image artifacts. This would not be something you'd want to play video games on yet, but the idea holds water. And this is really what we, we did it all for, to win an argument. Is there any reason we do anything besides to win arguments? I don't think so, but my argument was with my peers across all these institutions, which one is it? Is it a multifocal display with three layers that'll solve our problem? Is it a verifocal display with one layer? Or maybe this wacky idea of a focal surface is needed. And so at this point, you could either do a comprehensive vision science study on something like that multifocal test bed, or you could use a database. So since we work in the computer graphics field, we rendered uh, many, many scenes, took the depth maps, and optimized the position of the planes either for a fixed multifocal on the left, adaptive multifocal in the middle, or focal surface on the right. And the air is in diopters here. So just to give you a sense of how to read this, in the US, prescriptions are prescribed spherical powers in quarter diopter increments. My lead vision scientist, Marina Zanoli, believes that red line is where humans, that's like the threshold of what humans could perceive. So being below the red line is where we want to get to be perfect for humans. So right out of the gate, I love winning arguments. Fixed multifocal ain't looking great, to be honest, if you believe this analysis. Even with four focal planes on a database of natural scenes, 
your 75th percentile is almost a diopter off. It's going to look fine at low resolution, at like 2100 resolutions, which is where VR was at at the time. Once you get closer to 2020, you're going to be forced to do adaptive. And even with adaptive, you're looking at needing two, three, or four planes and still being far from the red line. It's also not a great sign. I didn't win my own goal, which is one focal surface can't do it. One adaptive focal surface on our database could get 75th percentile, like, you know, or, you know, most of this very, very close to the line, but there's always outliers. Like one little floating pixel in the scene could be off. But if you had two adaptive focal surfaces, you're almost done. You're better than a quarter adapter. So I think the conclusion I had is you can't avoid eye tracking. Eventually, you will need it. You might not need it today when we're not at 2020 resolution, but once you do, you better hope those eye tracking researchers give you 99% of people 99% of the time, or we're going to need to actually move to holography and recreate the wavefront accurately rather than approximately. All right. We okay for like five more minutes or so? I think we're okay? Good. Maybe more than five, actually. Got one more, one more tidbit. It's a dense talk. It was five and a half years of, of my team's life, so, uh, so I'll keep you waiting. <laughs> no. So my own research, I'm most known for computational displays. Arguably, until the very last thing, the focal surfaces, it's not really computational display. Rendering blur in an image is computer graphics. Verifocal is optical science. Multifocal, eh, there's some optimization there. Computational displays still are an emerging field that aren't quite well defined. Uh, you know, it's like image processing becoming deep learning. You know, it's getting rebranded all the time. All I will say is the lesson I've taken away is if we could solve these problems, if we could achieve Sutherland's vision, just with optical science, it would have happened, right? There's no Moore's law in optics. We're getting new ideas like freeforms that are old ideas but more manufacturable. We have not been able to make a system that addresses vergence and accommodation correctly using optical means alone. And so I would simply posit that if we're going to have it happen soon, we got to bridge the gap and start forming the image not just optically, but before you even display it computationally. And so the last example I'll give you before closing out is what a computational display for verifocal would look like. So let's come back around. With a verifocal device, if you buy that 10 elevator ride explanation, when you look at a near object, you will see a blurry mess. Maybe not this blurry, but blurry. If I achieve my dream and someday you all have verifocal headsets, then you get this, which is also not reality. Everything is now sharp and focused no matter where you look, which from a vision science perspective is a gap with reality, which we do not want to persist because it's a depth cue. And so this is where the computational bit comes in. It's really image processing. How do you add blur in, and what should that blur be? And Marty Banks, once again, is the pioneer in this field. He's shown in, in early work that rendering blur like this, so here's no blur, blur like this isn't enough. So this blur is, is just like a disk blur applied as a function of depth. It's a spatially varying, non-separable blur kernel that's the same in each color channel. And so what I really love about vision science being part of this endeavor, Marty has tested whether that hypothesis is true and found that if you blur differently in the different color channels, that actually is a cue to drive uh, the vision system. So this blur isn't quite right, which means as a computational display researcher, I need to hit a moving target. Every time I talk to Marty, I ask him, well, how has the target changed? And he's like, well, now you got to add this thing. you got to represent this peripheral part of the retina differently. If you're doing computational display research, the problem with it is it takes time. You know, you need to find a researcher who knows convex optimization, numerical methods, and they need half a year to do this blur in real time on one GPU or four GPUs in our case. And then someone tells you you need to now change that blur. Now you're looking at another six months. And so we saw this process over and over that even for Verifocal, we didn't know what type of blur we needed to add, and we could not optimize the algorithm until we knew what it was. So we needed a one-size-fits-all algorithm that no matter what the blur ends up being, the performance will be about the same. And so there's really only one way to go. You do the literature search. First, you see if this is really a problem. Can you ignore it? That was what I told you at the beginning. The best solution is to ignore the problem. It turns out, no. You know, through the literature, it's very clear that blur is a cue to depth. It is a driver not only to accommodation but to vergence itself. 
we got to get this queue correct eventually, so you can't ignore the problem. But you know you have too many systems to deal with. So in my own career, I haven't talked about light field displays. You could see those talks elsewhere. But just for gaze contingent varifocal displays, multifocal displays, and light field displays, we have three dissimilar challenges to support. And we don't even know what the blur is supposed to be. So this is a giant space of algorithms we'd have to mine out. Just that table, right? Three displays, two different types of blur. You got like half a dozen publications. It does not seem like a way to move forward in a consistent direction. And so we started looking for commonality. When you have a varifocal display, you now know this very well from this talk, as your eyes accommodate and you verge through the scene, essentially nothing happens if you're doing the job right. The only thing you got to do is render blur that's depth dependent. But that's a spatially varying blur kernel. It's very hard to do with a real-time graphics engine. So that's one thing. Multifocal display is a little different. Instead of rendering gaze contingent blur, you're not using the eye tracker generally, but you have to solve an optimization problem to decompose the imagery across the layers, given the color buffer and depth buffer. And then for light field, it's even more different. You have an array of lenslets, let's say, and you're rendering hundreds of perspectives that each don't really have blur intrinsically. Each of these has been a huge subfield. PhD theses, we thought, this is going to be hard. We can keep building these headsets, but if the algorithms to drive them keep evolving, it'll be decades till we find the right algorithm for the right headset. But as with many researchers who got their PhDs a few years ago, I was not trained but have heard of deep learning. And so Lei Xiao joined my team, and I said, Lei, I know nothing about real deep learning. I took a course in grad school on non-deep learning. Do you think deep learning can be a miracle for this field? And he said, I don't know, let's see. So here's what we did about two years ago. We sat down and we said, these are all the outputs I want. What input do I want? Well, there's only one input you could possibly want. If you're a game developer, you have a game engine that gives you a color buffer and a depth buffer. If you can generate all these outputs from a color buffer and a depth buffer, then you can drive any computational display just by retraining. And if Marty Banks tells you you need to change that blur a little bit, change your training database, don't change your algorithm. This seemed like a clear direction forward for the computational display field by killing it. There's only one algorithm, which is go to an artist, generate a training database, and go rerun it. Now, it didn't kill the algorithm because someone has to make a, a network that is, has few enough layers that it can run in real time on a mobile processor. So there's still a compute challenge, but it means we did not need to solve a numerical optimization problem from scratch for every computational display. So this is the network that Lei Xiao came up with. We call it deep focus. To my knowledge, it's the first time deep learning has been used end to end to train a computational display. And here's what you see. We trained on, multi on varifocal inputs and outputs, on multifocal inputs and outputs, and uh, on light field inputs and outputs. And in every case, we achieved uh, better than state of the art image quality using traditional metrics like SSIM and PSNR. But the real question is what do you train on? So I'm still new at deep learning. What I love is, this is my second favorite video of the whole thing. This is our training database, uh, which we've made uh, public, again, to drive the field forward. So this goes all the way back to Alberti's window and grid drawing. Alberti didn't need to master drawing the holistic scene. He put a grid up on the world because you only had to understand local patches. And so what we learned is this doesn't have to look photoreal. This is just a collage of random junk. With, with different textures and specularity and reflectivity. But by having a random collection of junk, if you look through a pinhole at any given patch, it looks like reality. The numbers of occlusion, disocclusion is correct for reality. And this is enough to give locally varying blur a uh, very accurate depiction. So put it all together on four GPUs at the time. And just by changing one input, you put color and depth in, and you ask where you'd like it to be blurred. You can see between ground truth and deep focus, at your distance, I don't think you can tell the difference, which is very different that you've seen blur in video games, but is not designed to be accurate as it falls on your retina. So let's zoom in here, as you have to in a publication. If you look at these hands along the top, it may look subtle, but compared to ground truth, all these existing methods generally don't quite get the blur around disocclusions correct. And that's, of course, what's driving the vision system, I would hypothesize. It's very hard to see at your distance, so I'll use a basic image quality metric, SSIM. 
And here you can see that a lot of the, the problem with depth blur comes about at the edge, which is unfortunately where the salient information is. So there you go, the first deep learning algorithm for computational displays. And again, my hope is this convinces people the next time they want to build a computational display, you're gonna have to crack open a deep learning book if you've never done it, because I think it's the best way to hit a moving target. Marty and the whole field of vision scientists I love so much, they will always learn more. They'll never stop in learning what needs to be done, and so your algorithm will have to expand to fit that. So here we zoom through the scene. This is a real-time use of the algorithm. So you can see there's translucent surfaces, specular surfaces, aliasing, all sorts of things that an algorithm would have to contend with. And then given that crazy random scene database, this is an A-B comparison between accumulation buffer, which is ground truth, and deep focus on the right. And here you can see toggling between near focus and far focus. Uh, and so I hope all of you get a chance to see something like this uh, someday. So I appreciate the extra time. Let's wrap up real fast. What lessons have we learned? Normally you call this conclusion, but again, some of this work, much of this work was public before. And so in the context of electronic imaging, I want to share the lessons I as a researcher learned. 10 years ago, I finished grad school. Five years ago, I was moving to Oculus Research. I've now walked a path, and not the path I expected. I expected to end up being a professor. I ended up leading a pretty large research and development team. And I've learned some things that I'd tell myself in the past, and so I'll save you some time and tell you what I learned, which is what I said earlier. Don't get obsessed with a problem, right? I had every right when I came into Oculus Research. Given the work I'd done, I had a blank slate. If I wanted to build a 200-degree field of view headset, no one would have said not to. If I wanted to build the first high dynamic range headset, I would have had cart you know, empty slate or blank slate to do that, you gotta restrain yourself. It's like a kid in a candy store. Just because it's a cool problem doesn't mean it's an important one. And so it really took convincing that this should be what I should work on of myself. Because I thought, literally, five and a half years from now, will people even care? And apparently so. Hopefully you found this interesting, but it's a real subtle problem. And the reason I did it is it's the only thing missing in cutting in Vishton's chart. It's the only thing that we have not achieved yet in imaging and displays, so it seemed like a good place to start. And so again, take home message, memorize this chart. It's really useful, but also realize if you're working on photography and it's two-dimensional, if you're working on displays and it's two-dimensional, you're really at the tail end of a curve. There's not a lot left. You know, Feynman said there's plenty of room at the bottom, but there's not infinite room. I think all of us who are researchers are driven to do the unexplored territory. And it's really ultimately why I committed the, this phase of my career to virtual and augmented reality, is I saw there was much more low-hanging fruit that needed to be grabbed. And so with head-mounted displays, I think we did it. In five years, we found a viable path to addressing vergence accommodation conflict. And along the way, we had a lot of fun. Whoops, slides are jumping around today. So another lesson I had is, of course, when you're in a corporate R&D environment, there's that tension between wanting to drive the company forward right now and doing something that actually moves the field forward. And I hope we struck a balance. This mechanical electronic vera focal, it looks like a startup because it was. It was designed to fit the near-term needs of the VR and AR industry, but that's not enough for a researcher. We have to do things that are wacky and crazy and bad ideas, and that's focal surfaces. And we have to do the vision science. That's the multifocal test bed. And then we have to actually think, as computational display researchers, how do we stop just publishing the next increment and try to jump to the conclusion? And that was what Deep Focus was all about. And so again, I love electronic imaging because it thinks the way I do. It's not just about hardware. It's not just about better sensors. It's not just about algorithms, better image processing techniques. And it's not just about vision science. Inside of this conference, there are separate tracks for each of these. The only difference I would say is I would hope in the future we don't have separate tracks. The way I run my team is a chaotic mess. Vision researchers sit with image processing researchers, sit with the people hacking Arduinos. I think this is the only way to make progress because something like multifocal or focal surfaces would not happen in isolation. It requires these different disciplines fighting against each other. And so I love that mess and I hope we see more shared sessions at this conference in the future. And so that's it. That's display systems research. Uh, and so we've nearly reached the end, so if you're sitting in the audience, you should always ask the question, what's the take home message? Well, I think I have it for you. Here at Electronic Imaging, we've largely been pursuing Alberti and Lippmann's window, creating ever improving cameras and displays, but ones that are fundamentally flawed. 
As Ivan Sutherland showed us, there's something through that window, a room where you can take personal action and interact with compelling 3D content. So I encourage each of you to join me in the SDA community already here to drive our imaging systems to record faultless three-dimensional depictions. But once that goal is achieved, then, as with Ivan Sutherland, I'll return to computer graphics to not just reproduce reality, but to go beyond photography and explore everything we can imagine that's on the other side of that looking glass.